These aren't the stories your mother told you. No, these are the other stories. <laughs> <laughs> Today's episode of The Other Stories is The Ribbiting, written by Kay Hanifen and narrated by Erica Ventura. The most terrifying thing on earth is not the scream in the woods at night. Nine times out of ten, that's just a horny bobcat or fox just looking for a mate. No, the most terrifying thing is when the woods suddenly grow silent all at once. The birds stop singing, the frogs stop croaking, and the cicadas stop buzzing. That means there's a predator around, one that the birds and the frogs and the cicadas don't want to alert with their sound. Not that they would have, anyway. Not with the row Trish was having with her boyfriend, Jared. Popcorn? Emma held out the bag. I took a handful before passing it to Greg next to me. How long do you think this is going to go on? He asked. I shrugged. My sister, God bless her, had terrible taste in men. Every single guy she was with was either a lazy slob who wanted a mommy instead of a girlfriend, cheated on her, or was terrible in bed. The biggest charmers were all three, as I learned against my will from her rants. Her boyfriend of nine months, Jared, seemed to be in the first category. From what I could tell before they joined us on this camping trip, he had forgotten to pay the water bill for that month, forcing her to scramble to pay it before they left so that they'd have water when they came back. This was on top of being the one in charge of packing for their camping trip. She sure can pick them. The tension had been palpable the whole hike up here, and it was obvious that they were going to explode at some point. Honestly, I was surprised that it took this long for the screaming to start. Might be better to go to bed and let them yell it out, I said. Why'd we bring them along again? Greg asked. Because she's my sister and I love her. I grabbed a marshmallow from a bag and impaled it on a metal skewer. And she's the one who owns all the camping gear. Jared, though, I have no idea. She insisted. There was a lull in the arguing as they both stormed off to opposite ends of the campsite. Emma furrowed her brows, the dancing flames of the campfire making her crinkled forehead look like a caricature of a human face. Do you guys hear that? She asked. We paused, listening, but heard nothing. No owls, no cicadas, no frogs. What do you hear? Greg asked. Nothing, Emma replied. And that's the problem. It shouldn't be this quiet. She was right. There must have been something nearby, something to cause this quiet stillness as though the woods were holding its breath. I was about to suggest that we take out the bear spray, but then Trish huffed and threw herself into the folding chair. Sorry, guys, she said. I know you were looking forward to this, and I just went and made it awkward. It's fine, I replied pulling my flaming marshmallow from the fire and blowing it out. I offered it to her. Thanks, Penny. She slid it off using a pair of graham crackers and chocolate. I knew I shouldn't have brought him along, but I hoped that he might finally be the one to win you guys over. Trish and I were twins, and as the older sister, It was my duty to vet all the men she dated and give my seal of approval. Greg and Emma, our childhood best friends, were basically like brother and sister to us. So, every time we dated, our partners had to face the scrutiny of three siblings who would cheerfully help one another hide a body. She sighed. 
I swear, we don't usually fight like this. And he's a lot more on top of things. Maybe he just isn't cut out for camping, I said. Not everyone can be rugged outdoorsmen like us. Hear, hear, Emma said, raising her beer. You're being surprisingly understanding about him. Nah, we're still roasting him. I skewered a marshmallow and held it to the flames for emphasis. I may have offered her one out of the goodness of my heart, but that was it. My generous deed was done for the day. We fell into a silence, one that would ordinarily have been comfortable, but instead highlighted the unnatural stillness of the woods. We didn't even hear the wind rustling through the trees, just the gentle crackling of the fire. Greg used his skewer to prod at the flames, allowing for more airflow. So, who wants to do the honors? I asked. Same rules as always, scariest story wins. Emma grinned as she assembled her s'mores. And what do we win this time? This, I said reaching into my backpack and pulling out a novelty t-shirt from a tourist shop that said, Made Love in Loveland. It was kitschy, stupid, and we would all kill for it. As reigning champion of the Campfire Tales Scarathon, I'll start with the traditional tale of man versus frog. Trish rolled her eyes. Just get on with it. So, long ago, on a clear summer night like tonight, a rookie police officer was patrolling the highway with a grizzled old cop two days from retirement, Emma added, earning an elbow to the rib courtesy of Trish. At that time of night, there were very few people on the road, so he had his brights on shining a light through the impenetrable darkness of the wilderness. He turned the corner, and that's when he saw it. The Loveland Frogman. It was six feet tall, with bright green skin, and the most piercing red eyes of any animal the officer had ever seen. When it spotted him, it opened its massive mouth, and a tongue shot out like an arrow, grabbing onto the front bumper of the car and refusing to let go, even as the officer tried to reverse and drive off to safety. So, he accelerated, ran the frog over, and raced back to the police station. When he returned with the rest of the on-duty officers, the giant frog was gone. They laughed him off. At least, they did until they heard a deep, reverberating... <coughs> a bullfrog chose that exact moment to croak, earning delighted screams from my sister and friends. I might have screamed a little too in surprise. Though, if you asked me, I'll deny it. But then, there was another scream. A deeper male one that did not come from four campers who'd been spooked by a well-timed croak. Trish leapt to her feet. That sounds like Jared! Heedless of wilderness safety, she ran in the direction of the scream. Emma and Greg grabbed their walking sticks, and I grabbed the bear spray before following Trish into the thicket. She came to a sudden halt in a nearby clearing, and we ran into her. What the hell? I whisper yelled. She raised a shaking finger to the center of the clearing, and there, silhouetted in the moonlight, was Jared struggling weakly against some kind of pink snake. No, not a pink snake. A tongue protruding from a wide, 
moss-colored mouth attached to a giant frog. It was maybe six feet tall, with a massive distended belly that quivered as it pulled him into its gaping mouth. The Loveland Frogman was real, and it was eating my sister's kind of shitty boyfriend. We have to help him, Trish cried. Throughout our childhood and teenage years, Trish and I took Taekwondo. Though we were both black belts, she was the more passionate and athletic out of the two of us, and absolutely fearless when practicing stunts. So it should not have been a surprise that she would run at the monster frog and aim a flying sidekick into its stomach. Her foot sank deep into its flesh, burying her hiking boot. It stumbled backwards but didn't fall, instead swiping at her and knocking her to the ground. She didn't get back up. Trish! I yelled, this time the reckless one. The frog swallowed Jared whole and turned its attention to my sister, who laid wide-eyed and paralyzed on the ground. I pulled out the bear spray and released the safety clip. Hold your breath, I told her before pulling the trigger and grinning at the frogman. Have some seasoning with your dinner. The frog roared. I don't know how else to describe it. The frog roared and fell backwards, rolling in the dirt as its throat pouch expanded and shrank. Right. Frogs breathe out of their skin. So I basically just directly sprayed its lungs with capsaicin. Serves it right for eating my sister's boyfriend. Can you move? I asked, and she weakly shook her head. Though the shape of the frogman reminded me of a bullfrog, It might also be part poison dart, its skin secreting a neurotoxin as both a defense mechanism and a way to paralyze prey. Shit, I muttered, and then slung her over my shoulder in a fireman's carry. If the poison had taken effect that quickly, then it could very easily kill her by paralyzing her heart or lungs. We have to get her to a hospital. It's a three-mile hike back to the cars, Greg said. As though answering the distressed cries of the frogman I'd sprayed, we were suddenly surrounded by the sound of deep croaking. Emma held her walking stick out like a bow staff. Then we should get a move on. I've never been much of a runner. My sister was always the athlete while I just did my best to keep up, but adrenaline is a hell of a drug. I could hear her heart racing in my ear as we sprinted to our car, the sound of ominous croaking surrounding us from all directions. A pink tongue shot out from the shadows and stuck to Emma's leg, knocking her feet out from under her. She screamed as the frogman began pulling her to its waiting mouth. With a yell, Greg stabbed down with his hiking stick, pinning the wriggling tongue to the dirt. It let go of Emma, and she staggered to her feet. Greg helped her up, and we continued our mad dash through the woods to safety. My muscles ached for rest, but Trish was now struggling to breathe and needed a hospital. Finally, we broke through the tree line and through sheer luck found ourselves standing near the lot where we parked our cars. That was about the extent of our fortune, though, because a small army of angry frogmen stood between us and our way out of here. Don't let them touch you, I warned. Wasn't planning on it, Greg replied, pulling out his own canister of bear spray. Who has their keys? Emma asked, digging through her pockets. Shit, I didn't have mine. Emma's pockets were empty, and so were Greg's. A wave of despair washed over me until Trish squeezed my shoulder. Her keys were in her back pocket. Thank God. 
With a battle cry, we charged the frogmen, holding our breaths as Greg and Emma used up their pepper spray so that we could get to the car. Though my eyes burned, I still found the button to unlock the doors. As the Loveland frogmen recoiled from the toxic vapor, we threw ourselves into the vehicle. Jamming the key into the ignition, the car started just as one of the frogmen leapt on the top of the hood. I gunned it. Maybe if it stuck with us for the whole ride, we'd be able to use its skin to find a cure for the poison. But the frog had other ideas. It banged on the windshield until it shattered, the glass blinding me as we spun out, crashing into a tree. And then, the Loveland Frogmen descended upon us. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of The Other Stories. The Riveting was written by Kay Hannafin, narrated by Erica Ventura, edited by Carl Hughes of music by Dark Fantasy Studio and Tom Robson, and sound effects provided by freesound.org. The episode illustration was provided by Luke Spooner of Carry On House. A quick thanks to our community manager, Joshua Boucher and Jasmine Arch, and to Joshua Boucher and Karen O'Brien for helping with our submission reading. And of course, to Ben Errington, the social media chubacabra grunting and howling in the nighttime wilderness, digitally speaking. Kay Hannafin was born on Friday the 13th and once lived for three months in a haunted castle, so obviously she had to become a horror writer. Her work has appeared in over 40 anthologies and magazines where she's not consuming pop culture with the voraciousness of a vampire at a 24-hour blood bank. You can usually find her with her two black cats or at kayhannafinauthor.wordpress.com on Twitter at at theunicorncommy1 or on Instagram at Catherine Hannafin. The links will be in the show notes. Erica Ventura is an artist, mother, bilingual narrator, and a husbandry technician. How does she manage it all? No idea, but her artwork can be seen on Instagram at at E-F-V-E-N-T-U, or you can visit her artist page at facebook.com forward slash bioartsy. The Other Stories is a production of the Story Studio Hawk and Cleaver, and is brought to you with a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. That means don't change it, don't sell it, but by all means, share the hell out of it. Until next time.